So I want to talk about user name spaces. The reason they're interesting is they're the, the, the cornerstone of building unprivileged containers, but they're also uh, the, uh, the building block, the primary building block for a number of other interesting pieces of technology. And I'll say a little bit more about some of those pieces later on. A little bit about me. Um, I was for many years a maintainer of the Linux Manual Pages project. This provides about a thousand pages that document system calls and C library functions. I wrote a lot of those pages. I also wrote a book. Um, I do training. Okay, I can do without that slide. Um, so, before looking specifically at user namespaces, I want to look at the concept of namespaces generally. And it's hard to nail down some sort of concise definition of namespaces, but this is my poor attempt. A namespace wraps some global resource to provide isolation of that resource. There's a number of different namespace types. Currently, there's eight um, and counting. There's a new one appears every now and then. The most recent one appeared in 2020, I think it was. Each one of those namespace types isolates some kind of resource. These are a few examples. So UTS namespaces isolate host name, domain name. Mount namespaces isolate the mount list. This means different groups of processes can see different mounted file systems. Uh, network namespaces isolate network infrastructure. Each container, for example, can have its own network infrastructure. For each namespace type, there can be multiple instances on our Linux system. When the system is first booted up, there's one instance of each namespace type. This is called the initial namespace instance. Each process resides in one instance of each particular namespace type. So of course there's eight namespace types. Each process to, uh, resides in one instance of each one of those eight namespace types. For the processes that are inside a particular namespace instance, they're sharing a view of a particular global resource. If that global resource gets modified, the change is visible to all of those processes in that namespace instance, but it's not visible to processes that are in other namespace instances. And this is kind of abstract, so let's make it a bit more concrete. A simple example, UTS namespaces. What UTS namespaces do is isolate two system identifiers, host name and the domain name. Uh, domain name here means the NIS domain name, the yellow pages domain name, as it was once called. Why could it be useful to isolate these identifiers? For example, this means that each container can have its own host name, which it could broadcast on DHCP and therefore get assigned a unique IP address by DHCP. The name of this namespace it has ancient origins. It comes from the name of a structure that was defined way back when called uh, the UTS name structure. UTS name, Unix time sharing system. So on any particular um, Linux system, there might be multiple UTS namespace instances. Processes in a particular instance see a particular uh, host name and domain name, but that host name, domain name is private to that instance. It's invisible to processes in other namespace instances. So, as I said, a picture makes this a little clearer. We've got then this idea, three different UTS namespaces here. Each namespace contains some member processes, the black circles, and within, say, this namespace instance here, these processes are seeing a certain host name. If that host name is changed there, that change will be visible to the other processes in that UTS namespace instance, but it won't be visible to the processes in the other namespace instances. We've got commands. Oh, I'll back up a second. There are system calls for building this infrastructure. We've got, we've got commands that are layered on top 
of those system calls. And I want to talk about those commands a little bit because I'm going to use them in some demonstrations. First of all, in each PROC PID directory, okay, PROC PID information about a process with a certain PID, there is an NS subdirectory. NS, of course, for namespace. And inside that subdirectory, there's a bunch of symbolic links. These symbolic links have names that are suggestive. There's one symbolic link for each type of namespace. If you look at the contents of these symbolic links, they are rather unusual looking strings. They're not path names. Rather, they're strings of the form namespace type, colon, and then in square brackets, a number. Now, this number is actually an inode number. It comes from a, uh, an internal file system that is used to support the implementation of namespaces inside the kernel. You can't see this file system in user space but internally it's mounted by the kernel and each namespace instance is represented as a file in this internal file system. And what you're seeing here is the inode number for a particular namespace instance. And the point is, each one of these numbers is unique per namespace instance. So one use of these files, they have many uses, but one use is if you see two processes where the inode number inside these files is the same, you know those two processes are members of the same namespace instance. We've got some commands for, for working with namespaces. There's a command called unshare. Unshare lets you create new namespaces. You specify which namespaces you want to create with the options. And then you can say that you want to run a command inside that new namespace or inside those new namespaces. Uh, the command, if you leave it out, defaults to being a shell. There's another command, nsenter. This lets us step into an existing namespace um, and, and execute a shell command. Again, we give options to say which namespace do we want to step into, and we can give a command, or if we leave out the command, the default command is a shell. Each one of these commands takes options that say what kind of namespaces do we want to work with. Uh, you'll see there's consistency across the two commands. The option letters for, these, for each namespace, they're, they're the same option letters. So let's try a demonstration. Um, creating a UTS namespace. So. I've got two shells here. They're both in the initial UTS namespace. And if I look at my host name here, I see a certain host name, bn. If I run the same command down below, of course, I see the, the same host name, because these two shells are in the same namespace instance. Now, another command that I want to use a little bit, and I'm going to copy this command, is This command, let's look at the symbolic link for this UTS namespace. And I'll just copy that command. I see a certain string there. If I run the same command down below, I see the same string. This is telling us these two processes, these two shell processes, are in the same UTS namespace. Now, if up above, I then create a new UTS namespace. Whoops, that was wrong. Uh, I, I say unshared u create a new UTS namespace. Sudo, because to create most kinds of namespaces, you need to have a privilege. Uh, the privilege is a, a so-called capability capsis admin. And I'll just say I'm going to have a shell there. Okay, now if I type hostname here, I still see the same hostname. 
And the reason is when a new UTS namespace is created, it inherits a copy of the host name. But what I could do now is say host name Langvid. And okay, the host name has been changed. But down below, I've still got a shell here in the initial UTS namespace, and if I type host name, I still see bn. If I use that read link command in the top window and in the bottom window, whoops, I see two different numbers. These, this is telling us these two shells are in different UTS namespaces. But we already saw that because um, we saw different host names for the two shells. Now, I want to get the, sh the PID of that shell up above, the shell that's in the new, new UTS namespace. Now, down below, I can say sudo nsenter dash t5137 dash u step into the same UTS namespace as the process with this PID, which of course is the shell in the upper window. Now, if I type hostname, I see Langvid because I've stepped into that other UTS namespace. And if I run that read link command, I see the same string as up above. This new shell is in that new UTS namespace. Okay. Alrighty, so I'm getting closer to talking about user namespaces, but I still need a little bit of background. And this is the notion of capabilities. The traditional Unix privilege model divides users into two categories. Normal users who are subject to a lot of rules and restrictions, and super user who gets to bypass a lot of rules and restrictions. The traditional way of giving a process um, privileges is to create a set user ID root program. To create a set user ID root program, you take a binary, you change its ownership to root, and then you turn on the set UID bit. The way you do that, you say chmod u plus s. Now when you do that, if a process executes this program, the process's user ID changes to being the same as the user ID of the binary. In other words, UID zero. As a consequence, the process gets the full power of super, users, super user and therefore the program can do the things that super user can do. This is obviously a powerful technique. It's also dangerous because if the program gets compromised, then the attacker has access to the full power of super user. So this, 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 there's this coarse granularity of the privilege model. Either you have no special powers or you have all the powers of super user. And what that means is if you have a process that has all the powers of super user and it gets compromised, then there's really no limit on the damage that the attacker can do on the system. Capabilities are an attempt to mitigate that situation. And the idea is, let's break the power of super user into smaller pieces. As things are currently, there are 41 different smaller pieces that are documented in a certain manual page called capabilities. Just a flavor of what we have here, of, here's three examples out of those 41. There's a capability called cap DAC override. This says you can bypass file permissions checks. Um, cap sys-time says you can make arbitrary changes to the system clock. Cap sys-admin unfortunately lets you do way too many things, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> 
The idea then is, instead of having set UID root programs, which are very powerful, instead you can create binaries that have one or perhaps maybe two, if necessary, capabilities attached that let the program do some particular privileged operation. The point here is that the binary is a weaker binary. If it gets compromised, the attacker has less power and hopefully the attacker can do less damage because the thing that is compromised is weaker. So just to summarise then, we've got this idea that processes can have capabilities, some subset of the power of root. Programs can have capabilities attached and when a process executes that program, the process gets those capabilities and the whole point behind this idea is having processes with some subset of capabilities or binaries that have some capabilities attached, these things are less dangerous than traditional super user processes and set UID root binaries. Okay, user namespaces at last. What's going on here? The idea here is that we can have per namespace mappings of user IDs and group IDs. In other words, Inside a user namespace, a process might have certain credentials, certain user IDs, certain group ID, but outside the namespace, it has different credentials. And the really interesting example, or the in interesting use case here is a process that has UID zero inside the user namespace, but has an unprivileged user ID outside the namespace. This process has super user powers, but only in that user namespace. Now, we're going to see what that means, um, but the point is this, is this process does have some kind of special powers. We need to know some things. User namespaces have a hierarchical relationship. Each user namespace has a parent user namespace, which has a parent user namespace, and so on going all the way back to the initial user namespace, which obviously doesn't have a parent. The way that that parental relationship gets established is when the user namespace is created. The, uh, the parent of a new user namespace is the user namespace of the process that created this new user namespace. The reason that this parental relationship is important is it determines how capabilities work inside namespaces. I probably won't have time to talk about that, but I have got some end slides that um, go into a little bit of detail there. When a new user namespace is created, the first process in that user namespace gets all capabilities, all 41 capabilities. In other words, it gets super user powers. The kernel just does this. The kernel simply says, first process in a new user namespace shall have all capabilities in that user namespace. But only inside that user namespace. So I mentioned this idea that a process has certain credentials inside the namespace but has different credentials outside the namespace. The way that that is set up is by creating UID and GID mappings. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All righty. Um, the way these mappings are set up is by writing strings to a couple of files called procpid uid map and procpid gid map. Now, there's a lot of rules about how these files need to be updated. Rules because of security. Um, how these files are updated, when they can be updated, who can do the updates. Way too many rules for me to talk about here, but you can read about them in a certain manual page. The lines inside these files look like this. Lines that say an ID inside the namespace 
maps to an ID outside the namespace, and then a length. So that um, you can say that a certain range of IDs maps to a range outside the namespace. And so a common example that you see is a mapping like this that says UID zero outside the names, sorry, inside the namespace maps to some unprivileged ID outside the namespace. In this case, I've said the length of the mapping is one. Only one UID is being mapped. I could have, for example, had the number 10 there, and that would have been saying that UIDs 0 through to 9 inside the namespace map to 1,000 through to 1,009 outside the namespace. But here I've just mapped one user ID. OK. So let's just try another example. So, first of all, I'm doing all of this as an unprivileged user. UID 1000, GID 1000. And what I'm going to do is create a new user namespace, dash capital U. Dash R says I want to create a, a namespace with root mappings. Root mappings means my user ID or my group ID maps to zero inside the user namespace. And then I'll run a bash shell. And shell prompt has changed in an interesting way. The reason for that is if I now say ID, this process has UID zero, GID zero inside the user namespace. If I look at the proc pid uid map file here, there was a mapping created that says zero maps to 1,000 for length one. Okay, zero inside the namespace maps to 1,000 uid outside the namespace for length one. There's a similar looking gid map as well. Uh, those mappings were set up by that dash r option. Now, if I look for dash e cap, it'll do cap in slash proc slash dollar dollar status. I'm looking in the proc pid status file because I want to see the capabilities of this process. And there's a couple of fields in that file that show me this process's capabilities. And the particular lines that I'm looking at here are these lines here. The, these are hexadecimal bit masks. Um, those hexadecimal bit masks represent 41 bits for the 41 different capabilities. And what this is telling me is this process has all so-called permitted and effective capabilities. So it has all the powers of super user. Of course, none of us is very easy, very good at reading hexadecimal bit masks. There is a shell command that we can use instead called get pcaps. And you give it a PID as an argument, and it gives you a human readable representation of the capabilities. This is a little hard to interpret still. You need to know the rules what, of what this notation means, but the equals EP here is saying this process has all effective and permitted capabilities. Now, this shell here has certain PID. Oh, I can already see the PID there, of course. But what if outside the shell down below is in the initial user namespace? How does that process look in the initial user namespace? Inside, it's, inside the user namespace, it's got UID 0, GID 0. But let's look from outside at the UID, the GID, uh, may as well the PID of that process. 5356. Five, outside, the process looks like it has UID 1000, GID 1000. 
This is consistent with the fact that outside the namespace, this is an unprivileged process. Okay. Now, one more thing. I've got super user powers inside that user namespace. Maybe I can do some super usery, super usery things. Maybe I can change the host name. Let's try that. Well, first of all, I see a certain host name there, VN. Let's try and change that host name. I can't do it. Okay, we need to know a little bit more. Okay, so user namespaces and capabilities. I mentioned already the kernel gives the first process in a new user namespace a full set of capabilities. But those capabilities can only be exercised on objects that are governed by the user namespace, by that new user namespace. Of course, what does that mean? Well, we've learned a few things already. There are a number of different namespace types. Each of those namespace types governs some type of resource. UTS namespaces govern host name and domain name. Uh, mount namespaces govern mount points. Network namespaces govern network infrastructure, and, and so on. A new piece of information. Each non-user namespace is owned by some particular user namespace. There's an ownership relationship between user namespaces and non-user namespaces. The way that, na that ownership relationship is established is when a new non-user namespace is created, the user namespace that owns that new namespace is the user namespace of the process that created the new non-user namespace. If a process tries to do operations on some kind of global resource, what the kernel checks is, does the process have the necessary permissions, the necessary privileges in the user namespace that owns the non-user namespace that governs that resource? Again. A picture is going to help, but first of all, we need a command. The picture I'm about to show you is what we would get if we did this command. What this command is saying is create a new user namespace with root mappings and at the same time create a new UTS namespace and run some program. That program, of course, is the one being run inside this process. Now, this process, well, I'll back up a second. To begin with on the system, there was the initial user namespace. And there was an initial UTS namespace, an initial network namespace, an initial mount namespace, an initial PID namespace, and so on. The effect of the command was to create a new user namespace, this new user namespace is a child of the initial user namespace. And because a new UTS namespace was created at the same time, okay, we have a new UTS namespace there, that new UTS namespace is owned by the new user namespace. Okay. Now, this process here, it was set up with the root mapping. Its user ID inside the namespace is zero, but outside the namespace, its user ID is some unprivileged ID, let's say 1,000. And because of the magic that the kernel does, the kernel said, this process has all permitted and effective capabilities. It has the powers of super user. On the other, and, oh, and this process, of course, is a member of the new UTS namespace, and it's a member of the new user namespace. But of course, it's a member of each one of the other kinds of namespace as well. Which network namespaces is it a member of? Well, when we ran that unshare command, we didn't say create a new network namespace. Therefore, 
this process is still in the initial network namespace. It's in the initial mount namespace, it's the initial um, PID namespace, and so on. Alrighty. Now, suppose this process tries to change the host name. The necessary capability to do that is the one called Capsis Admin. In that case, what the kernel asks is, we're changing the host name, which UTS namespace is this process a member of? And the answer is, it's a member of this UTS namespace. And then the kernel says, which user namespace owns that UTS namespace? And the answer is this one. And then the kernel says, well, does the process have caps as admin in that namespace, in that user namespace? And the answer is yes. And so it is allowed to change the host name. By contrast, suppose this process tried to do a privileged network operation, perhaps uh, bring a network device up or down. Because this is a network operation, the kernel says, well, which network namespace is this process a member of? And the answer is, it's a member of the initial network namespace. And then the kernel says, well, which user namespace owns that network namespace? And the answer is the initial user namespace. And then the kernel says, well, what capabilities, in particular, the necessary capability is capnet, capnet admin, what capabilities does that process have in that user namespace? And the answer is, this process has all capabilities but only in its own user namespace. It doesn't have those capabilities in the initial user namespace. And therefore, it can't change the, uh, it can't bring the network device up or down. If we generalize this to sort of the, the container situation, things are like this, where for our container, there's a new user namespace and that user namespace owns an instance of each one of the other kinds of namespace. I haven't shown all the namespaces here. I don't have space on the slide. But the new user namespace that, uh, for the container, it owns a PID namespace, it owns a UTS namespace, it owns a mount namespace, it owns a network namespace, and so on. And there are processes inside that container, including, for example, a, an init process with PID1. Okay, now there are APIs to discover what is set up on your system. You can discover the parental relationship between user namespaces, you can discover the ownership relationship between non-user namespaces and user namespaces. These APIs, they're documented in, in this manual page here. I'm not gonna try and talk about those APIs, but I've got a program that uses those APIs to give us a certain kind of visualization of our namespace setup. And I'll demonstrate that program in a moment. And my program is fairly simple. If you want to see a much better program, someone not far down the road from me, literally speaking, um, did it better. And you can find that project on GitHub. It gives you a better visualization. Okay. So let's try an example. Let's start with fresh shells. So what I'm going to do here again is say, create a, uh, a user namespace with root mappings and a new UTS namespace at the same time. And I should have said something, by the way, that I didn't say earlier on. Notice this time I didn't use sudo. And the reason is, to create user namespaces doesn't require any capabilities. And a process, a new process in a new, UTS name, a new user namespace gets a full set of capabilities, which means, in effect, you can create other kinds of namespaces at the same time. And therefore, I didn't need to use sudo here. Now, 
I've got a process that's in a new username space and a new UTS namespace. Now, let's look at the host name. Okay, it's BN, but let's try changing the host name. That was successful. The reason is this process is in a new UTS namespace that is owned by the user namespace where the process resides, and this process has all capabilities. You can see it there. Get this process has all capabilities in in its user namespace. That's what equal, <coughs> equals EP is telling us. Okay. Now, on the other hand, just to remind myself of the syntax here, um, let's do a privileged networking operation where I say uh, IP link set dev allo up. Actually, let's try down, because the, the, the loopback device is already up. <laughs> okay, I have all, all powers of super user here inside this new user name space, and therefore can I take the loopback device down? I can't do this because this process is a member of the initial network namespace, and the initial network namespace is owned by the initial user namespace, and this shell doesn't have any capabilities in the initial user namespace. Okay, now, just my window there a little. Um, just to give you an idea of what's going on visually, I'll use that program of mine. And what I'm going to do is just go where I have that program. Oops, what am I saying? Okay. If I just run this program like this, it'll show me all the namespaces on the system and all the processes that are members of all of those namespaces. This is too much information. Instead, I'm going to say, let's restrict what's being displayed here to the process that is in the top window, which is in some new namespaces, and compare it to another process, the process that is in the initial namespaces, perhaps the shell down below. So the PID of the process up the top, that's 5491. The PID of the shell down below, that's dollar dollar. This will show me all the namespaces of those two processes. But even that's too much information because there's a lot of namespaces, eight different types. So I'm going to just restrict the output a little bit more and say, just show me some of the names, some of the namespaces. Let's say the UTS namespace, the network namespace, and then perhaps just the mount namespace as well. I need to do this with sudo because it relies on me reading the contents of proc pid ns symlink files that belong potentially to other processes. And in order to do that, I need to have privilege because what this program does is scan all the proc pid ns files on the system, including ones that belong to other users. Alrighty, so it's a crude visualization, but uh, some things. Indentation is meaningful. Indentation either indicates parental relationship, so this username space here is a child of the initial username space, or indentation represents ownership. And this is telling us, for instance, the initial mount namespace here is owned by the initial username space, the initial network namespace is owned by the initial username space, the initial UTS namespace is owned by the initial user namespace. And of course, there's one other namespace here. This is the new UTS namespace, and it's owned by the new user namespace. That's what the indentation is telling us. And we see some PIDs. Here's the PID of my shell up above. It's a member of the new UTS namespace. It's a member of the new user namespace. And it's a member of the initial network namespace and the, a member of the initial mount namespace, and so on. 
So you can get these kinds of visualizations to discover the shape of the namespaces on your system so you understand what's going on. Okay. Alrighty, I'm nearly done. Okay, so what can we do with this stuff? Why is it interesting? Well, the sort of the, the, the motivating force for a lot of this work was unprivileged containers. The idea that without being super user, we can fire up a container and you know, do the container thing, but without being super user. Um, and Docker and Alexi and so on, they're using uh, this, this idea of user namespaces to have unprivileged containers. But there are plenty of other use cases as well. Browsers are using um, this infrastructure to do uh, sandboxing of the renderer process. Historically, the way that this was done was with set user ID root helper programs. But set user ID root helper programs are dangerous things because maybe they could get compromised locally. By using user namespaces instead, we have, um, uh, we don't need set user ID root programs, so things are more secure because we don't have set user ID root programs as a point of attack. This is an interesting use case. You can have a user namespace with a UID map that looks like this. Unprivileged ID maps to the same ID outside the namespace for length one. Inside this user namespace, there is no UID zero. That's an interesting kind of guarantee. You know the process inside this namespace can't get super user powers by switching to UID zero because UID zero doesn't exist in this namespace. Um, perhaps some of you are aware of tools like, for example, FireJail. FireJail is a sort of generalized sandboxing application. It's built using namespaces as well as other pieces of infrastructure like control groups and setcomp. And you can do generalized sandboxing of applications. And FireJail, one of the nice things about FireJail is when you install it, it comes with a, a bunch of pre-created profiles for many common applications. So straight out of the box, you can use FireJail to sandbox your favorite application to hopefully improve security a little bit. That's your goal. Um, Flatpak. Or, or Snap, for example. They're also using this kind of infrastructure. Flatpak and Snap, these are, of course, uh, tools for packaging applications where a pa an application is packaged with all of its dependencies. And this means that uh, the end user can just deploy the application without going through any special installation steps on their local system. All they need to do is install Flatpak and download the pre-created package, and it just runs out of the box without needing to install any additional dependencies. And there are plenty of other applications as well. Um, if you're looking for more information, I wrote a series of articles about namespaces a few, few years ago on LWN. There's some manual pages that I wrote. Um, something that someone else wrote, which I think is rather interesting to read, Linux containers in 500 lines of code. It's, this page is an incredibly detailed annotation of what steps do we need to do to isolate a process in the fashion of a container. You know, how do we get a process isolated in the way that Docker isolates a process, for example? And the interesting point here is it doesn't take that much code. Tools like Docker are big, not because of the code that is needed to do the isolation, but all the infrastructure that goes along, all the orchestration that goes along with Docker. Um, so this is a very interesting page to read. And I am actually done. And if there are any questions, please. I don't think it does. Uh, so the question related to NSS, did you say? Yeah, to, related to NSS modules. I don't think it does. I think this is an orthogonal piece, but uh, also I'm not very knowledgeable in this area either of NSS modules, but I'm reasonably sure that this is just an orthogonal concept. So the question is, 
do you have to create multiple processes in order to get multiple namespaces? And, and the answer is um, no. You can actually, the underlying system calls allow you to create multiple namespaces at the same time. There's a flag that I can use with the system calls that says, what kind of namespaces do you want to create? And you can specify multiple flags to create multiple namespaces. Now, the rule is that for most kind of namespaces, a capability is required, caps is admin. User namespaces are exceptional. No capability is required. This means an unprivileged user can create a user namespace. But the point is that the process that is created as a result of that step is itself privileged. And what this means is, and it has caps as admin, for example. And what this means is you can combine all of the flags with, cap, with, um, with the flag that creates a new user namespace, and you create a user namespace and other namespaces at the same time while being an unprivileged user, because the user namespace step gives the resulting process all capabilities. You can do it in one step. So I mean, I, I could have, you know, for instance, if I go back here, and here I said create a new user namespace and a new UTS namespace, I could have said create a new network namespace as well. And now, there, oh, look, there's the command, it's in my history. Um, now I could, in that new network namespace, now I'm able to take the, net, the loopback device down. And that's because that loopback device belongs to the network namespace that is owned by this new user namespace. Okay, so there are three new namespaces there in play. The new user namespace, the new UTS namespace, new network namespace. There was another question back here. I'll, I'll, I'll say that SE Linux policies can deny privileged operations for sure, but SE Linux policies, as far as I know, are not namespaced. What that means is you can't have different SE Linux policies for different user namespaces, as far as I know. Does, can who see the device? Can, I think what you're asking is, yeah, so what I think you know, what you perhaps are asking is, you know, can a process down here, which is in the initial network namespace, see that network device in the new network namespace? No. What we could do is step into that network namespace and then see the device, but from the outside, that device is invisible. Um, there was a question here in the middle. So the question related to file permissions and how that works in this model, I think the simple way of thinking about that is suppose you know we've got a process up here that has you know UID um, has UID zero. Does that mean that I can do things like creating a file in the root directory because I have UID zero? Well, when it comes to doing file checks, what happens is the process's credentials are mapped back to what they would be equivalent to in the initial user namespace. And in the initial user namespace, this process has UID 1000. So it, you know, it couldn't do those sorts of things in, in, say, the root directory. Does that answer your question? Yeah. There was a question at the back, I think. Yes, please. You'll have to yell at me. Um, the way it works, the, the underlying system call is called setNS. Oh, sorry, yeah, setNS. Um, a process can only move itself into another namespace. One process can't move another process into a namespace, but a process can move itself into a different namespace, assuming it has the necessary privileges. Yes, I, I could have, I, I chose here to set up a UID map that said, you know, unprivileged ID, okay, my time is up, unprivileged ID maps to zero inside the namespace, but I could have mapped something else. And I could have had a process that is simply unprivileged inside the user namespace. Correct. Yes, correct. Even if it was privileged in the original namespace, it would be in a new namespace where it potentially didn't have privileges, didn't have any capabilities. Uh, I'll take one more question. A process can move itself to a new namespace. Oh, no, a process can move itself to another existing namespace. Yes. So, the last one, sorry. Yeah. So, the question is suppose we have a, a namespace set up like this where there's a, a UID map that maps uh, unprivileged ID down to zero inside this user namespace. Suppose a, from down here we created the process that stepped into that user namespace. 
how do we determine what credentials that process is going to have when it steps into the namespace? That's determined by the mapping that was already created. And there is already a mapping that says you know, cat slash, oops, slash proc slash dollar dollar slash UID map. There is that map. Now here, down below, I've got a process that has UID 1000. And I need to know the, sh the PID of that shell up above. Um, if I now said down here, sudo, in fact, I don't need to do that, ns enter, say I want to step into the same user namespace and the same, let's say, UTS namespace and the same network namespace as the target PID 6404. Don't think I need to use sudo there. Oh, no, this, uh, okay, yeah. No, I will take sudo for reasons I don't want to try and explain right now. Okay, that's, don't ignore that, it's just an error from my bash startup script. Um, now, if I now look at the ID, the credentials of that process, it has UID 0, GUID 0, and the reason is because it had 1,000 outside the namespace, and the mapping said inside the namespace it would have UID 0. Perhaps an, an interesting counterexample, though. Oh, I can't do that from here. Actually, yeah, no, that, that'll be enough. That'll be enough. Thank you for your time.